Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Indiana State Police Roadshow. Thank you for tuning in again this week. I'm your host, Sergeant John Perrine, Public Information Officer for the Indianapolis District. The Roadshow is brought to you by the Indiana State Police Alliance and Cops for Kids, a subsidiary of the State Police Alliance. For more information about our sponsor, you can visit them at www.indianasfinest.com. Thanks again this week to Tom Trial for putting us on YouTube, uh, making us look good, doing what he does, and uh, incredible work by Tom behind the cameras. Our guest today, kind of a different show. I've had a lot of guests on the show, but nobody ever as popular with the with the employees here at WIBC or MS than Piper. Piper's been roaming the halls down there, and uh, everybody loves to see Piper. But also uh, Wade Meisberger and and Rick Rosales from the Indiana Department of Corrections. And so, kind of Rick, let's let's start with you and tell me what you do uh, for the Department of Corrections and kind of where your role is is with Wade. Yes, so I oversee community engagement for the Indiana Department of Correction, and what that means is uh, we have 21 facilities throughout the state, and each of those facilities has a community engagement coordinator, and what they do is manage all of the volunteers, volunteer operations, community outreach, um, any of those aspects of the facility. So what I do is kind of support them at the state level, at central office, through various efforts, be it internships or uh, training or policy, or if someone contacts me and they're interested in volunteering, I'll kind of help determine where they'd be best to volunteer or, or how they can best contribute to our facilities. Very good. So so you have volunteers that come into these facilities from all different aspects to try to, to help you know, called Department of Corrections, as, as I was told before, uh, it's, it's more than just incarceration, it's correction, right? Absolutely, yeah. We've got about oh, over 4,000 volunteers throughout wow. the state that, wow. that serve a number of capacities, from helping with the last mile, our coding program, to uh, tutoring or mentoring, um, you name it, uh, the folks inside our facilities yeah. probably need it. Yep. And Wade, I, I feel like you have a very intriguing story, and I want to get to what you currently do now, but I think it's important that we talk about how you got here. Uh, and, and let's start back. Uh, you told me you were 19 years old. So if you don't mind, let's let's kind of hear the full circle story, if you don't mind. Well, when I was uh, 19, I had just gotten out of the Navy. I'd gotten an other than other than other other than honorable discharge. And uh, I came home and I was drinking pretty heavily uh, and I was doing the couch tour and moved around the United States. Uh, just visiting friends, not really holding down jobs, couldn't hold down a job. Relationships with my family were pretty bad. Uh, eventually made my way back to uh, Indiana um, from Indianapolis, but uh, ended up in Bloomington where I was uh, found a roommate with a friend. And uh, my best friend who I had grown up with, Mike, uh, had invited him down to a party uh, one night in 1991. And uh, we were both drinking uh, pretty heavily we were both drunk and we both got into a big fight and I grabbed a tree branch and uh, I hit him upside the head one time and it just killed him instantly and instead of uh, calling for help I got scared and ran and I stayed running for 13 months uh, the case kind of took a on a life of its own and um, eventually they put me on America's Most Wanted and the FBI's 10 Most Wanted list uh, in August of 92 after they profiled me on America's Most Wanted I was captured 219 they caught me in Charlotte North Carolina after 13 months of being on the run and extradited me back to uh, Bloomington where I went to trial and at 20 I was convicted of murder and sentenced to 48 years in prison uh, for that. In uh, 1998, my sentence was reduced uh, after reviewing new evidence uh, to manslaughter, uh, where they, they actually kept the murder conviction, per se, the murder, but they gave me the time for a manslaughter, voluntary manslaughter charge, which was 30 to 15. Mm -hmm. In 2007, I was released after serving a little over 15 years and uh, I did pretty well. Up until that point, I had not been diagnosed with uh, any mental illness, but I was still struggling and still having problems with my relationships, inability to keep my job. Um, I was on probation. Uh, eventually had a breakdown, had a psychotic break in 2012 and uh, violated my probation for a technical violation for failure to report 
uh, to a probation appointment, uh, went back to court after my arrest, and the judge sentenced me to mental health treatment in the Department of Correction. Uh, for three years, I was treated by DOC at the Wabash Valley Correctional Facility SNU unit, which is a special needs unit, the psychiatric facility, where I was correctly diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, put on medication, and started group treatment and psych- psychotherapy. And uh, to this day, I still do that. I still see a psychiatrist every three weeks, and I still take my medicine, and I still participate in group therapy. And I've done really well since then. And I was released in 2015. Okay. And then since your release in 2015, you've, you've found a way, maybe something that helped you tremendously through your PTSD. Uh, now you're, you're finding a way to give that back to, to help others. So kind of explain your role now. Uh, it was probably, what was it, two and a half years ago? Almost yeah. three. Mm-hmm. About three years ago, I was invited by uh, the warden. Uh, at Wabash Valley to come down and give my story to the community advisory board of how well that I had done since my release uh, after I left Wabash the SNU uh, and their part of the community advisory board was a news anchor uh, from one of the local TV stations they did a, a program on me a little short interview and that's where uh, after I'm that's when I met Rick, met Rick. But uh, after that, we began to uh, find a way for me to get into the facilities and actually make a difference with the guys. So what I do now is I go into the facilities and I've been doing guest speaking with the offenders, uh, giving pretty much just telling my story mm-hmm. and saying, hey, you know, this is me. I was I was there. I was where you were at. You know, you can do this. You can get out and you can succeed, too, if you just try. Yeah, and Piper's a big part of that as well. So what's Piper get to do? Piper, she Piper gets all the attention. It's always about it's always about Wade or always about Piper. Never about Wade. Nobody ever remembers me. <laughs> can we get Piper up to? Can, can Piper take a look at it? Uh, everybody sees sure. Piper. She hey can. Piper, hi there. This is Piper hey. McKenzie. She's actually a, a five year old American bulldog. There she is. Hey Piper. <laughs> I've never interviewed a dog before. This is kind of cool. <laughs> I'm not guaranteeing she's going to sit still for too long. So Piper, if I'm a great radio host, just say nothing at all. <laughs> there we go. See, she's a five year old American bulldog. She's a PTSD service dog, and she does a lot for me. She goes with me everywhere I go. But she's a big hit with the guys. The guys love her, and everywhere the staff love her. She's just a good, a good. Studies show that um, interaction with dogs actually reduce stress levels and blood pressure levels, wow. blood pressure levels instantly. So she's not only just a, a good companion to have; she's also a good talking point to begin conversations with mental health. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, part of the show is actually having her involved with interacting with the guys. Great. And and so now, Rick, how how often do you guys bring in the dogs for for the offenders? Because uh, we do start to see these studies that it helps. Yeah, we have several dog programs, but I mean, obviously Piper comes in every time Wade comes in, and and he's right; she's absolutely a hit. And 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 even a lot of the participants in his speaking engagements will comment like, "Oh, I haven't seen a dog in this long," or "It's so nice being able to pet a dog," or "I remember from childhood," and it brings all this positivity. Yeah. And it really helps. Yeah, and that that's very good. So, so Wade, you've you've now started to expand outside of of Department of Corrections with Piper, and and you said you've uh, used Piper to, to help calm you know public safety, other other types of groups. So, what other programs are you doing with Piper? Last year started a program called Pause Patrol where we actually go in and we uh, visit with firefighters and law enforcement personnel. Uh, As I had mentioned earlier, just interactions with dogs reduces stress levels and stuff. So we try to uh, visit fire stations at least once a month just to interact with the firefighters to bring a smile to their face. Uh, And we're also available for the firefighters for traumatic experiences Mm -hmm. if they have a, a trauma call where we can actually go and uh, work with a firefighter or law enforcement individual. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I can tell you uh, from somebody in public safety is um, no matter what kind of day you've had, you come home and your, your dog is always happy to see you. And that, that kind of is a, a stress relief by itself, you know? And so it's, it's nice for those people that have dogs or don't have dogs uh, that they, they understand that. Um, so Rick, what are some other programs uh, within IDOC that you guys are working that maybe, is, is a new concept, a new idea that, that maybe we haven't done in the last 10 years. 
Um, I think the best example of that would be the last mile for our coding program. We've expanded that to five different facilities, and so we're on a big hunt for volunteers for that to serve as mentors. So a, a very uh, new endeavor for us is the tech industry, and so finding volunteers that, that are individuals in the tech industry that want to help and come in and mentor. That's probably our newest, most innovative program. Okay, so, so if somebody's out there that wants to volunteer, how do they get a hold of you guys? Yeah, absolutely. So we've got all of our contact information on our website. If they go to our homepage, volunteers right there on that on that top half and it has all the contact information from forms to the handbook to facilities each facility has their own contact information so we've made it very easy and accessible for folks that are interested in anything um, if you're tech inclined that's that's great but even if you just want to help but you don't know really what you yeah. want to do mm-hmm. you don't know what what we offer uh, the website's a great place to start you know I think it's almost like um, consequence versus disappointment and you think about like when you get in trouble as a kid, like you're not necessarily as afraid of the consequence as you are of disappointing your, your parents. Mm-hmm. And and I think this mentorship could kind of be relative to that, where they know coming out at the end of their sentence that, that there could be consequence if they break the rules. But if they have that mentor there, mm-hmm. it's more, hey, I don't want this person has dedicated their time to me. I don't want to disappoint them. And that might be enough to, to keep them on the right side of the law. Yeah, absolutely. And we have formal mentoring at at some of our facilities, but being a volunteer, you're going to be an informal mentor. You're going to serve as that positive role model, that example of the successful citizen, and they're going to want to model that. And and so that's a great place to start is just, I want to help. I don't know how, and and then we can take it from there. And Wade, you can speak from from advice or from experiences. You spend most of your adult life incarcerated. When you come out, it's got to be overwhelming. I mean, you just don't have anywhere, any help overwhelming i remember my first trip uh when i first got out my mom was uh, with me just going to walmart and trying to pick out a tube of toothpaste the the overload of the sensory overload of all the the different choices and the the colors and the people it was just um, overwhelming so there's there's definitely a need for people uh especially in the reentry aspect to to get prepared so that their successful integrate reintegration in society is uh not problematic and less as stressful as possible so they do succeed and did you have any type of mentorship uh, at the end of your sentence or coming out? Or I got most of my stuff from the SNU. The 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 I support got a lot of support uh, from the the doctors and the, the group therapy. This is what actually prepared me. That's that's where I got my support. Okay, you know, great conversation about the importance of the Indiana Department of Corrections being a correctional facility, and and it's not just about incarcerating these people as a punishment. It's about Hey, they, they did something wrong. Uh, they're incarcerated. But how do we reintroduce them to society and set them up to be successful? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the vast majority of them, they're coming back to our neighborhoods. So the more we pour into them, be it through volunteers or through his mental health treatment that, that came from staff and groups, um, whatever we can invest in them, we will see that return on the outside in our communities. Yeah, and, you know, these folks are going to be your, your neighbors, your mm-hmm. coworkers, uh, you know, uh, people in your community, why not offer that olive branch and say, hey, you know what, I want to take on the challenge to, to make you a, a valuable part of our society. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Wade, I have to ask because uh, I think people are intrigued like I am, but when, when you were featured on America's Most Wanted, did you see the episode? I did. So how did that make? I, I'm just curious how it made you feel when you saw it. Did you f- really think, oh, this is this is the end? I did. I especially when they came and knock came and knocked on the door a couple hours later. So you so do you know um, somebody saw the show and called? Is that how? You, do you want to hear a joke? Or you want to hear something? I'll just tell you something funny. It was the person that actually called on me uh, was a lady who I installed her cable for illegally uh, <laughs> just a few weeks earlier than that. Okay, this, this is the one that called me. So. So, called on so you went and hooked her cable up illegally for her. You're right, and she and, called on And she said, hey, I saw this guy. I uh, saw yeah. my tattoo. Yeah. Have you had any interaction with her since? I mean, of no, course not. No, no of labor. course not. Um, <laughs> but I, I just can't imagine the, the paranoia of being on the run for a year and then being featured on a national television show like that. I'm sure you were just looking over your shoulder. And... Yeah, and it's to this day with my PTSD, that's one of the one of the significant factors is the paranoia. To this day, I still suffer from paranoia uh, from being on the run, being, yeah. being hunted like that. Sure. Uh, the paranoia, the fear, you know, it's to this day has affected me and will always affect was there me. Ever, was there ever a point in that one year where you felt like, I got away, like they're not going to find me? Or did you always think there was an end? I always thought there was an end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And his story arc from there to now, I, I think, speaks a lot, not only to him, obviously, as an individual, but the potential we have in our facilities. Absolutely. Where if you invest, if you diagnose, um, they can come around and turn back into success stories, and then we as a department are there to welcome them back Absolutely. because our folks need to hear these stories. Incredible full circle story. I want to thank my guest, Rick Rosales and, and Wade Meisberger, uh, and of course, Piper down there, who's been a, a fantastic guest. Thank you for tuning in. Roadshow is out. Thanks.